Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Higgins, producer of the CX Leader podcast, and thank you for listening. The following is an encore presentation of a Live with CXPA event, 10 Traits of Effective CX Leaders, with our own host, Steve Walker, interviewing panelists Lori Jones from Walker, Sandra Mathis from Microsoft, and Jonathan Ruckman from Brookdale Senior Living. And Walker has produced a guide on the 10 Traits of Effective CX Leaders as a free resource. Simply go to walkerinfo.com slash effective CX leader to download this free resource. And we've also produced a podcast series on this topic. You can find that at cxleaderpodcast.com. Just scroll to the bottom of the page and click on the 10 Traits of Effective CX Leaders series. And now, the Live with CXPA presentation, 10 Traits of Effective CX Leaders. Enjoy. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are happy that you are with us for this special edition of Live with CXPA and Walker. I am Gabe Smith, CCXP. I'm the content manager and the associate director for CXPA, the Customer Experience Professionals Association, coming to you live today from cold and snowy Akron, Ohio in the Midwestern United States. I always love hearing from you. I want to hear from you. Uh, where are you tuning in from today? Be sure to uh, get your comments in now and also be sure to share your perspectives, your comments, your questions throughout today's broadcast. Um, you know, one of the things I found from doing a lot of these programs, I can promise you this is a great program, but it's going to be even better if you are a part of it. So I cannot believe, I don't know about you, I cannot believe that it is February. Um, perhaps you're like me. You made some New Year's goals. You made some New Year's commitments. Maybe those were personal commitments. Maybe those were professional commitments. But hey, we're in February now. <laughs> we're we're one month in. We can start to take a little take stock of uh, how we're uh, measuring against those goals and those commitments. One of my areas uh, was leadership. Answering this question of how can I be a more impactful leader in my professional life, and so. Really, it's for that reason that I couldn't be more excited to have the conversation that we're going to have today to welcome you today to the first of what is going to be several broadcasts that we are going to be holding in 2022 in partnership with Walker to really dive deeper into this question of what does it mean to be an effective and impactful, a strategic customer experience leader in your organization? So, you know, whether you're watching today and, and you're a practitioner Maybe you were a consultant. Maybe you were even someone who aspires to become a CX professional. Maybe you're in customer service or marketing or product, and you're wondering, hey, what does it take to become a leader in this field? We're glad you're here, and we hope that this series equips you with the skills and the knowledge and the tools and the techniques that you need to make that happen for you. So let's take a look at the comments and see who we have with us today we have Julie, who is tuning in from Belfast in Northern Ireland. We have Laura, who's tuning in from Barcelona. We have Michelle, who's tuning in from British Columbia. Kevin from Atlanta. So many comments here that I'm seeing. I love this. Uh, Enrique, hello to you in Guatemala. Hello, Anita in Kenya. Um, absolutely love it. Just going down the list, and I wish I could show everyone Peru, Canada, Nigeria, Austin, Texas, uh, Hookham. We got uh, Madrid, uh, Lima. So many uh, folks from around the world. Love seeing all of these leaders uh, who were joining us today. Uh, excited to have you with us. So as I said, we've got some amazing guests lined up to share their perspectives on 10 traits of effective CX leaders today. Um, can't wait to get started. But first, I want to turn the program over to our guest host for today. Uh, he is no stranger to the Live with CXPA program. He guest hosted several of our live stream broadcasts last year, and he is more than just the chairman and CEO at Walker. You may also recognize his voice from the CX Leader podcast, uh, which provides weekly insights for business leaders to improve results by unlocking the potential of their customer experience. Uh, he is stepping out of the recording studio today to join us live, and I couldn't be more excited to welcome Mr. Steve Walker. So take it away, Steve. Hey, 
Hey, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. It's uh, delightful to be back with everybody. And uh, thank you for that kind in introduction, Gabe. Um, uh, we, we truly are uh, grateful for the partnership that we've had with CXPA and uh, so delighted that we were able to uh, work out this series on uh, what I think is probably the most important aspect of uh, the development of our profession, and that is uh, the ability to lead and, and lead effectively uh, the customer experience within our organizations or with our clients or with our employees. And uh, that's really the, the, the concept that we came up with and uh, so, so fortunate that uh, we were able to put that together. And uh, yes, we're looking forward to it. We're gonna do uh, six episodes throughout the year um, and we're gonna talk and explore all things about uh, the CX profession and particularly from a leadership perspective. Uh, you were kind, Gabe, to mention the CX Leader podcast, um, which when we started that thing a little over four years ago, I don't think we knew exactly what we were getting into, um, but it's just really turned out to be a total blessing uh, for our company and I, and I believe for the profession as well. We've now done over 200 episodes and, um, you know, we really have, we've, we've, we've really kind of struck something. Um, about six months or so ago, I uh, just off the top of a head, you know, during a podcast, I, I kind of came up with a quote and it was, it was, uh, um, it was triggered by somebody saying something that was just another example of the impact that CX leaders can make in the world today. And I just quipped, I just said, you know, it's a great time to be a CX pro. And I couldn't believe that more today uh, than the first time I said it. Um, I think we are all so fortunate uh, to be in this profession at this time because of the appetite uh, within organizations for our expertise and truly the kind of the, the mission critical, the, the very important aspect that we do for our organizations. You know, we're, we're helping our companies be successful and win in the marketplace by doing right by customers, employees, and other stakeholders. And I can't think of a more noble cause uh, for a profession and, and something I'm very proud of, and I hope, I hope you are too. You know, the reason we started the CX Leader podcast is, is we did think that there was kind of a gap. And uh, in some ways, this is back to the future. Um, our first 10 episodes, no, not our first 10. I think our, our first three we did on a, a, a different report that we'd done before. But our episodes four through 14 were the top 10 aspects and the top 10 characteristics that a CX leader needs to have. And uh, we're going to spend some time talking about that. But I went back to the annals and listened to some of that stuff. And, uh, you know, if you if you do subscribe to the podcast, they're all on, on our website. You can go back and listen to them. And there's one actually one episode where we um, summarized and kind of highlighted all 10 of them. That is a, just a 19 minute podcast. That's really an excellent refresher. So if you're interested in this topic, we'll want to make sure that you know how to get to that, uh, at least that episode. But you know, one of the one of the things we talked about is that, for example, not many of us um, probably started out in our career to be CX leaders. Um, maybe maybe some of you did or some of you studied this in school, but I would guess that the majority of us uh, kind of got into it by accident. Um, and, and probably somebody chose us at some point uh, because of some other characteristics that we had um, that, that that we had you know, kind of the, the right stuff, if you will, uh, to play this role within our organization or within um, multiple organizations. So that was really kind of the impetus behind it. You know, the CXPA is not that old. Our profession is not really that old. And, you know, part of this is just the maturity of, of creating our profession. And when I go back and look at those early podcasts that are now, you know, about four years old, um, some of the things are just so timeless. And that's really why we thought to kick off this series, we should go back to sort of our roots and sort of the foundational aspects of what it takes to be a good CX leader. And um, I guess there's a, um, you know, that we, we, we will spend some time talking about each of the characteristics. I, I have one of my colleagues who's going to come on first. And then we have two outstanding CX leaders who are practitioners in fine organizations who are going to share some of their uh, wisdom and some of their experience with us as well. But I was struck recently that uh, the ex 
XM Institute, uh, XMI part of Qualtrics, the kind of the thought leadership part of Qualtrics, recently came out with a study. Uh, and I might ask uh, one of my colleagues who's on to post a, a link to that study. But um, one of the things they found is that uh, the differences between sort of high performing CX organizations and low performing CX organizations, they, they use the phrase leaders versus laggards. Uh, that one of the critical differentiators in that, uh, whether a company was a leader or a laggard, came right back to the leadership characteristics that we're here to talk about. You know, the, the, the highly successful CX organizations had really, really mature aspects around these characteristics. And those that were not as successful, the laggards, uh, were not as as um, mature or as advanced in in some of those characteristics. So there's your proof point if you need one uh, to believe that um, you know our uh, efforts to keep improving our profession and the leadership of our CX uh, people um, is uh, probably not just something nice to do. It's 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 really mission critical. Um, so at this point. Um, I'm going to get into that a little bit. I'm going to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Lori Jones. Hey, Lori, welcome to uh, Live with CXPA. Hi, Steve. How are you? Just great. I see you're in the office today. That's, uh, that's a good thing for you. I and, am. Uh, I'm getting the cold while you're in warm weather. Well, yeah, that's, you know, that's one of the good things about being late in your career is you and, and the fact that we can all work remote today, too. Exactly. That's one of the exactly. nice things. But, um, you know, I mentioned uh, you are my friend and my colleague, but just for the benefit of our um, audience here, just give them a little bit of your background and and uh, how maybe how you got into the CX profession. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so I have actually been with the organization here at Walker for I'm coming up on my 20th year. Uh, started back, you know, 20 years ago, really in that more program management and just transparently always had been interested in and always had kind of that that desire to think about how do you make experiences good, even though back then I didn't really know that I was thinking customer experience. As you mentioned, you kind of stumble into the role and you stumble into the industry, but kind of inherently always had this idea of how do we make sure we're doing the best that we can uh, for, for the people that we interact with on a daily basis. Uh, been with the organization, like I said, for a number of years and I, I kind of have grown up through the ranks. Uh, started in that program management, went into analysis and uh, consulting side of our business. And now I sit more on that business development side, helping organizations understand kind of what, what can Walker do? How can we help you? And how can we help ensure that you're focused on the right things to improve your customer experience? And yeah, just to brag on you a little bit, um, and I can't believe it's been 20 years. I'm so grateful for that. But um, you you literally speak every day to uh, organizations um, that are on all ends of the spectrum of trying to discover uh, their their way on this CX journey, right? Yes, absolutely. People who are just interested in, hey, I just need to understand what my customers think about this event that we're having all the way through to a really robust, they've been running programs for years, but they're just not making the change that they need to make anymore. And how do we, how do we take a pause and how do we figure out how do we move that forward? And, and there are people just, as you said, all over the spectrum and people who have grown up and lived in this space and then individuals who are like, I just got tasked with this and I have no idea what I'm doing. So it's, it's fun to talk to all of them though. It's really exciting to do that and kind of figure out where they're headed. It really is. And that's one of the really uh, great benefits of being on the, you know, the, the consulting side is that we get to see so many different companies and so many different people and you learn from each and every experience. Yeah. But now I want to take you back four years in your 20 year history, because you were one of the uh, instigators of this whole thing, weren't you? I was. I was one of the instigators uh, and one of the early podcast participants for one of the traits uh, when we started this a, a few years ago. And which trait did you do? Just for fun? I, I, the best one, passionate, because we passionate. released on Valentine's Day four years ago. So, you know, why not just tie it all together? I did not remember that. But of course, we do passionate on Valentine's Day. Why that, not? That, so, well, how did we come up with this? What, you know, kind of remind me why, why we decided this was such a great idea. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I did have to kind of think through and kind of talk to a few people to really remember. It was a few years ago. It was four years ago. And it was really when this idea of customer experience, the role of a customer, a chief customer officer, kind of the, the definition in, in colleges and universities, the degrees started coming out. And I think it's when it started becoming a little bit more defined or real. And the way that we kind of started this is qualitative research. Um, we want to get technical. And it was more of, hey, when you think about the people that you've worked with and you think about the clients or the customers that we've engaged with, what are some of the adjectives or what are some of the descriptors of those individuals that you think are really key to some of the successes that they're having? So, you know, we received lots lots of, of adjectives and descriptors. Um, and as we started parsing through those and really thinking about all the different uh, descriptions we were receiving, we were able to kind of bubble them up into the, the 10 that we're going to talk through today. Well, let's uh, cut to the chase. Let's uh, talk about those 10. And uh, why don't you just take us through them? Um, and uh, then we'll uh, add in some of our other experts and we can have a dialogue about uh, um, at least several of them, if not all 10. Absolutely. Yeah, there are really um, 10 traits that, that we'll show here in just a little bit. And the way that you look at them and the way that we try to think about them and, and kind of how we've bucketed them is they, they fall into two, what I'll say, categories. There's hard skills, and then there's the soft skills side of some of these traits. When you think about the soft skills and some of the, the characteristics that we labeled there, there's soft skills around the idea, my favorite, the passionate one. Do you have a flair? Do you have a enthusiasm for thinking about customer experience? Um, do you have a passion towards making sure that how people are interacting is really doing the best for everybody that's out there? Um, there are also other what I'll term, you know, soft skills, collaboration, uh, influential, focused, innovative. All of these are ones that are so much around just knowing how to navigate and partner and work with others that sometimes it's, it's, it's a matter of just learning and growing over time um, on how you can do those different pieces. And one that I think is really challenging when you, when you kind of think through customer experience and, and leaders there is the collaboration. When I'm talking to these different companies, there's silos in organizations and different people own different aspects of the experience or the journeys that customers go through. So knowing how to collaborate and break down those walls, um, again, I think it's a matter of over time, you learn how to bridge uh, those silos and make that happen um, accordingly. On the flip side, the hard skills. And these are ones, and there's two that I'm going to specifically call out. These are ones that really take some time and effort and energy to learn within the organization. The two that I think are probably the ones that I talk the most about would be the catalyst for change and the business savvy. And both of these are really around change management, and linking customer experience to business goals and business outcomes, which again requires collaboration and knowing how to link with others to tie all of that information together. And so it's been a challenge. Those are the ones that I think are, are hard and it takes time and figuring out how to do that. And another one that underpins all of this is the communicator. And it, that one is you know, not just how do you speak, how do you tell the stories, but it's also the strategy and how do you make sure that you are constantly communicating? We always say customer experience is not a point in time. It is an ongoing journey and it is continuing to evolve. And the communication underpinning of that is super critical to keep a pulse on in order to make sure everybody knows where you're headed within a customer experience program. Thank you. Um, and that's a great kind of set up for what we're going to do. But one one other quick uh, point is that uh, along with this report, we um, created sort of a self-assessment tool uh, against the traits, did we not? Yes, we did. And actually preparing for this, going through and thinking and re-looking at that, 
I realized it's a tool that we probably really need to be thinking through and sharing a bit more because it really gets you to start thinking about where are your personal traits? Where are you strong or maybe where do you need to focus? But even thinking about within your team and having your team evaluate this because you're not going to be perfect on all 10 of these. So how do you make sure that you're building a team that has the strengths and the the areas across these to make sure that you're truly being an effective CX leader and an effective CX team. Yeah. And I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Brenda Mackey, to make sure that we get in the chat uh, a way to access that self-assessment because um, one of the best things you can do as a leader is to be Mm self-aware. And you are right, Lori, not everybody is going to be perfect at everything. And this is exactly how you build out your team. Uh, And I think if I recall correctly, uh, in some of our benchmark data, it's funny, like, um, for example, analytical skills are something that are sort of uh, very polar. Uh, There's there's people that are really good at the analytics. And then there's also really effective leaders that don't know anything about analytics, but they got a great analyst on their team. Um, So that, again, you don't have to be good at all of them. Uh, You can uh, know your strengths and then know your weaknesses and build your team accordingly. So. Uh, it's just a really great tool, I think, for uh, any leader that's trying to uh, kind of practice continuous improvement. So, hey, uh, will you hang around when we get our other guests here and and Absolutely. be part of the dialogue? Great. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Well, good. Nice job. Um, now I want to uh, bring in a couple of uh, practitioners um, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on them before I uh, welcome them. But uh, they come from uh, probably two uh, different businesses that you could think of. Um, Sandy Mathis is, uh, the, um, director of, uh, CCE strategy and program management at Microsoft. And Jonathan Ruckman is the senior director of customer and brand experience at Brookdale senior living. So, uh, let's go ahead and welcome Sandy and, uh, Jonathan into the conversation. Uh, these are two great leaders at, at two very, very different organizations, but very, very, uh, um, excellent and high performing organizations uh, who also have very, very mature CX programs. And um, so I'm, I'm uh, and both of them have been guests on the podcast um, in the past. So uh, thank you for coming back and, and being a part of this discussion and also for your uh, willingness to, to share a little bit of your experience uh, with us around these uh, leadership traits. So Sandy, let me go to you first. And again, just for sure. context, if you could just give uh, those who are not familiar with a little bit of your journey and uh, how you got to the CX profession. Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here with you guys once again. Um, I'm Sandy Mathis. I work for Microsoft. I am serving in a program management role um, currently in a, cust- a connected customer experience organization. Um, My background is I actually started off in doing market research when it was called market research before it became consumer insights and you got tabs sent to you in a box. Um, So I've been doing research for a really long time. And then over a period of time did a bunch of different things. I was at Kraft, I was at Pepsi, again in the customer insights world, and then moved over to, uh, after doing some other things, moved over to Equifax where I led their a customer measurement um, program globally for a few years, and then uh, stepped into the role of CX strategist as a consultant for a few years before getting to Microsoft. So I've been, I've done a little bit of everything when it comes to the world of CX, and then most recently served as the lead for CXPA in Atlanta or in the Georgia and um, some of our adjacent um, areas uh, for the last three and a half years and just recently stepped down from that role. Good. Well, yeah, you come at it sort of like where I've come from, sort of more the traditional market research side. But I mm-hmm. think, uh, Jonathan, you have a little different path, don't you? And why don't you tell us a little bit about, I think most people know about Microsoft, but maybe people don't know Brookdale quite as well. So yeah. a little bit about your journey and then a little insight into uh, Brookdale too. Sure, Steve. It's great to see you again. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. So uh, I'm Jonathan Ruckman. I'm Senior Director of Customer Experience for Brookdale Senior Living. Uh, We're the largest senior living uh, company in the United States. We have uh, the full continuum of care from independent living um, all the way through um, uh, independent living and assisted living and memory care. So uh, my journey, uh, you're right, I didn't start off in customer experience. You're spot on with that, Steve. I started uh, in the world of advertising agencies in New York City uh, on large global brands. 
And that whole experience was about setting the promise. What, what does a brand promise to do? And I spent the first half of my career doing that at ad agencies. And then um, after the ad agency world, they then went client side. So I then went to Allstate Insurance Company, the brand marketing group in Chicago, and then a regional marketing and customer experience office in Nashville, um, and now Brookdale. So the second part of my career was um, how do we deliver on the promise? If a brand says we're going to do something, how do we do it? So it's, it's been a fascinating ride. It really is, because it's really there are two pieces to this puzzle. And um, I've been fortunate and blessed to have seen and um, worked in both parts of this. Well, I think the kind of the juxtaposition of Brookdale and Microsoft is is a great one for this topic, because I think part of the discipline that we create in our profession is that we have a lens that we can analyze a business through. And there are some similarities, no matter if you're in the highest tech, most valuable company in the world type of situation, or you're in um, what is perhaps the most meaningful and most um, intimate type of customer experience that you would ever have uh, for caring for those uh, uh, loved ones who are aging. And uh, we'll see some similarities and, and you both have really been successful leaders, both coming at it a little bit of a different uh, viewpoint. So uh, I'll start with you this time, Jonathan, but you took a look at the 10 list, hopefully when Lori was presenting and maybe knowing you, you might've even studied it a little bit before now, but what, <laughs> what did any of the, any of the things kind of resonate with you or what, what, what were yeah, kind of your initial thoughts? Um, I think Lori, you did an amazing job with this. I had not seen this before and I, I did study this and it's fascinating because what, what I would tell you is what I love about CX is there it's an art and a science. And there really is no right or wrong way to do it. What's right for one organization may not be right for another. So what drives it is leadership. At the end of the day, that, that's what drives this whole thing. So uh, when I saw this, I really was fascinated by it. And um, I, I completely agree with everything on here. What I would say, the one thing that I kept coming back to is I see one of these traits as really overarching over everything else. Um, and that would be communication. Um, I think it all, it's, it's what we say, it's what we don't say, it's how we say it, it's who we say it to. And, and what I learned in the world of advertising is that there's a lot of clutter out there. And in, in, the, in the corporate world, internally, we're fighting for shelf space. So we have to show that, you know what, this is not a project. We have to delineate, this is different. This is not a project. And you're right, Lori, this is, it's a journey. And, and I just think, you know, we have to strike an emotional chord internally and externally. And uh, so, yeah, so I love all of these. I would just say I see an overarching umbrella being communication. I love your analogy back to the brand days of uh, we're fighting for shelf space. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I think um, in some of my prep for today, um, I mentioned that the podcast that I went back and listened to, but, you know, um, the communication is overarching. And it's because we're trying to drive change in our organization. And when you're trying to drive change, it's almost impossible to communicate well enough. Um, and so you're right, that that is a great uh, kind of perspective on it. Sandy, what was your first take kind of based on your experience and when you studied the 10 traits? Yeah, so I agree with Jonathan as well as what Lori was, Lori was saying. So in, in two different ways, let me, let me break it down this way. So I do agree that I really think it comes down to communication, because if you can't do that, then nothing else on this list really matters. But at the same time, my second one actually comes down to what Lori was talking around passion, because as most people who have spent any time um, in, C in the CX world, they know that you have, if you don't have passion for this, there's a lot of pushing rocks uphill, boulders. Sometimes those things are going to roll back down on you and splash you, you know, splat you, whatever it may be. And so the reality is if you don't have that passion to kind of keep you going forward, then nothing else matters. And at the same token, if you can't communicate effectively, a lot of these other skills don't matter because you can't, you can't be effective at your job because you can't get them you know, your organizational leaders to uh, buy in um, in order to get you to those things around, you know, the analytic, how do you, or even being able to be a catalyst for change or having the savvy, like it's definitely a balancing act. Yeah. And uh, just to tease the, the uh, actual episodes a little bit, you, you guys both mentioned too, um, 
there's a the the uh, episode on communication is really a clever one done by uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Christina Kittle, um, and it involves sort of uh, um, uh, channeling your inner teenager. So I just that's kind of a tease to go back and listen to that episode, <laughs> but it's a really effective one on communication. And then the the passionate one, actually, uh, in our summary uh, podcast, Jen Batley, who is also our colleague. Um, she uh, added a, a 11th one that I think is kind of the um, it's kind of the, the balance to passion. And uh, so I'll just tease that out there and maybe we'll some people will figure it out. But uh, let me go back to you this time, Sandy. Um, mm -hmm. what, could you maybe share one or or two examples in your career where maybe you um, were able to leverage uh, one of these characteristics where you're strong and then maybe or alternatively where maybe you feel like, you know, you were able to empower some others on your team to um, kind of pick up on on an aspect of it that that wasn't your strength. Sure. So I, I think about uh, communication. Um, as I mentioned, when I, I'm going to use my my example, example comes from when I was at Equifax. Because that was a brand new program, there was a lot of time spent by the, lead, the leadership team at that point in time, along with me, just in terms of trying to figure out how are we trying to make this program um, happen? Because one of the things I wanna kind of dial back for one second too is talking about laggards um, versus leaders, or even if you are net new kind of starting off your program, at that point, the program was still brand new. And so having that effective communication really came into play because you're going, I had to go around to different business units to kind of explain and sell in the story of why we were trying to do certain aspects of the, of the program, why this matters to them, what's their with them, what are they going to get out of it. And so you're really kind of using that information and, and which kind of tips into a couple of the other, um, some of these other traits around being influential and also trying to show that we're trying to deliver something that's focused and all of that, put a package all that together and it really comes back to that topic of passionate. Um, if that energy doesn't come through, they're like, I've got 20 other things I could be focused in on. Why does this particular item matter to me? So like that's, that's one of, is one of the things. And on that journey, the, the role of being able to be influential so it's, we all know often it's not just how you communicate, it's what you communicate and how it actually is in, in turn um, interpreted by those around you. So being able to understand how you do that in a way that makes sense for, you know, for the audience uh, really was a very important aspect of that journey. Thanks. Jonathan, how about you? Any uh, kind of anecdotes or experiences that you might? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, go we talk about communication, you really have to know your audience. So when you're talking to executives, you're going to live at, at the high level, strategic, connecting the dots. And then when you're talking to, you, you know, down at the, the field level, people are agents of change, then you're going to get more tactical and operational. And something that, that I've done throughout my career is when I'm talking to that group, and, and it's probably my favorite part of my job, is it's a training for uh, whether it's a new executive director, whether it's a, a local agent, um, is I ask a group of people and I say, how many of you are leaders? And nobody raises their hand. And I'll repeat that question. How many of you yeah. leaders? And then a couple people and then, you know, they get it over time and people start raising their hands. And, and I say to them uh, that when they took their job, they didn't realize that they have two jobs. They have their day job, but they're also on the customer experience team. And that's a leadership position. And then I explain that what, what leaders do is they model the behavior for others to follow and they have to inspire others. And they have to set that example. And I go on and on. I use different examples. And I also tell them, and this is really important. Um, I say to them, how many of you spend money, your own money? And they laugh, they chuckle. I'm like, take your business hats off now and put your consumer hat on now. Did you ever an experience where you're in a restaurant and the meal comes out and it's an hour late and the food's cold? What do you do? And they say, well, we'll call the manager over. That's right. And you're going to sit back and you're going to wait and see what that reaction is and consumers in the back of our minds, we have an expectation how that manager is going to handle our issue. And we're going to tell a story one way or another. It's a fork in the road. So I make it real for them. I make it real. And people, we get so close in our day to day world of our own companies and businesses that we forget that, you know what, we're consumers too. 
and we have expectations. And what happens when our expectations are not met or exceeded? We tell a story and we as brands have the opportunity to control that narrative. So that's just a little bit about the training, but it's, I love it because I see all the light bulbs and people's heads go on, but it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Hey, Lori, let me uh, bring you back into the conversation for a minute, but uh, you know, you talk to tons of companies and tons of users, uh, you know, each and every month and year. Uh, what, what kind of, what's been your experience or what, what's kind of your favorite anecdote where you've seen one or more of these characteristics played out? That's a that's a great question. I, I think some of my my favorite ones were when we would get information and individuals, there's one client in particular, where we were able to actually start making the connections to um, business impact or business outcome, which let's be honest, that takes time, effort, clean data. There's a lot of moving parts there. So when you can really make that come to life and make those connections and then start to tell the story, um, it's really impactful. And we had an organization and a client that back in my consulting days, um, we were able to work and make that connection with customers that were unhappy and what that meant to the organization with uh, revenue and sales and that sort of thing. And, and kind of giving the warning of, hey, these people aren't happy. Um, and our contacts went and took that to the sales leadership, sharing this and kind of broke down those silos, showed the data, um, use the analytics, right? All these different pieces that we had pulled together um, and said, we really need to do something about this. And uh, they, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe what we were telling them, which is okay at the time until about six months later when that customer pulled and said, we told you we weren't happy and you didn't change anything. So that's when our team was able to go back in and say, here's exactly what we need to address. Here's how we need to change this. Here are the things that we need to do. So it was stepping back into that communication Unfortunately, that experience, while negative for the company, really then honed in on our team, the CX team, to bring in that influence, that trust, and all of that that is kind of inherently needing to happen. Sandy, you said it earlier. If we don't tell the story well and they don't believe you, then it's really hard to get them to do what you need to do. We unfortunately had a hard data point that proved that we knew what we were doing, um, but that's, we don't want everybody to have to have that kind of hard data point, but it was bringing it all together, telling the story. And then that just changed the entire perspective of CX and that organization moving forward. Yeah. Sometimes the, uh, the, the best lessons are the ones that are the hardest to learn, aren't they? And, uh, but that, that's a great example. And I, I think I recall in my prep that, um, from our, our database of leaders that have taken the assessment, business savvy four years ago was one of the lowest rated ones. Um, and I bet you we've advanced that in the last four years, but you know, that, that right there, that example is such a perfect one of, of why we got to be business savvy. We have to be able to communicate it and we have to be able to connect it to the, uh, you know, the broader issues in the business or um, we, we are not impacting the narrative to use your guys' words. Hey, uh, at this point, uh, I want to invite our audience to uh, uh, feel free to uh, engage in the discussion, and I will kind of monitor the chat, or Gabe, if you see something in the chat, uh, feel free to jump in here, but I got a couple more questions, but uh, by all means, for our audience, and it's a global audience, I'm, I'm so grateful to have everybody here today. Uh, if you have specific questions that you might want to ask these leaders, um, uh, now's your time. Um, I kind of tipped this off a little bit early, Sandy, or, um, but, you know, we can't all be good at all 10. Um, so kind of from from your perspective, you know, wh wh where where do you need support on on some of these things or where would you say you've tried to help help build out your team in terms of uh, compensating for things maybe that you don't like to do or or, or maybe you're not uh, feel as strongly about? Right. Um, I you know, I would say, Steve, it's. For me, it's those things that it, it really gets down some, especially for in my current role, it's the busy business savvy. So it is the, while I understand fundamentally what we do, I find myself um, leaning on like team members, um, even the client that I support and people on their team around trying to understand some of the intricacies a little bit better than I might not necessarily know right now in order to be more effective. Um, we talk a lot about, even though I'm doing project management, um, really working um, hand in hand with the change management team 
um, in order to help drive, you know, drive better experiences for our customers who are on the commercial side. Um, so those are probably the two that come up, you know, come up the come up the most for me when if I were to kind of bucketize them. Um, but the one thing that I will, I just want to like make mention of is when I look at these traits, so many of them work hand in hand and even based on this conversation reinforces that. So it's not a one or a, or the other as much as it is a combination of, of different traits. How about you, Jonathan? Yes. Yeah, I know so you're, right. you're yeah, passionate right. about communication. We know that in the brand <laughs> stuff. So. You know, uh, I have a great partner. I've always liked to partner with um, people who are really into the data because that's not my strong point. I mean, I'm not a data scientist. So I really like to have a strong, it's about collaborative. I think for me, it's just, uh, you know, I like to lead through people and I have a, a wonderful partnership always had with, um, with uh, analysts and, and data scientists that really can help. Um, it's a one, two punch, right? So they can come up with the numbers, but the numbers have to be understood. And my job is to take those numbers and present it in an actionable way. So uh, that's kind of how we look at the relationship. But uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I'd say from my own perspective, uh, what kind of resonates with me is I, I, I really gravitate towards more of the hard skills um, and that that motivates me. And and I kind of get, you know, I, I love the analytics. I love the the strategy. I love the, you know, the solving the problems and getting in and doing the work. And I really do. I need to be supported by the, you know, the people that are more on the soft skill uh, soft skill side. So, and, and I just, again, I can't reinforce enough from a leadership perspective, um, you know, being aware of your strengths and also your weaknesses really empowers others on your team. Um, and it's not, it is not at all a deficit to, um, you know, engage others that have skills that are different than yours. Hey, we do uh, have some uh, questions coming in from the audience. So uh, I'm going to take these in real time here, but uh, this one comes in. How do you come up with solutions to provide to sales, for instance, when customers are unsatisfied based on the surveys? How do you provide the most effective advice support? So this is very specific to uh, kind of the sales function. We know sales people sometimes are, uh, um, you know, they can be they, they're relatively confident uh, individuals typically and a little bit independent, but you know, how, how in your experience, Sandy, have you uh, worked with sales teams, for example? Right. So it makes me think a little bit of what, about what Lori was talking about in her example a few minutes ago around you get results back and they're not, um, they're not great. And everybody's like, why should we, you know, they don't want to necessarily believe until something actually happens. Um, I think it's important to make sure that sales folks are not off chasing what I call you know, little blue haired ladies who live in Florida and go to the bank on Tuesdays, meaning you're not going after the unicorns. It's really important to make sure that the salespeople understand that it's not just about a couple of people saying something, that this is really a bigger, um, is a bigger or more thematic kind of experience, whatever the issue may be, that that is what is actually going on in order to kind of use that to say, this is where we need to focus in on. And by the same token, when you are, rolling out something that is new and you want to you know drive an improved experience or something is being replaced um, that is driving a better experience making sure they understand why that again why that is actually going to make this a better experience for their customer um, and that they're at the same time being thoughtful about what it is that their customer is in fact looking for and it's not a one size fits all so that's the, that's the kind of gets into that art and science like you're making sure that you're um, you're, you're kind of balancing out between the two. And Jonathan, I'd love to hear your take on this question because with your advertising background and you, you framed it really well, particularly in your business, you can't sort of set a brand impression if you can't deliver on it. Um, and then, you know, selling in your world is something that is very, very uh, personal and, and, you know, has to be done super professionally. So how, how have you handled that with, with yeah, yeah that's true i mean senior living is the only category that i could think of where the customer lives with the brand 24 7 365 yep. it, it, and that's why we call it a community it's not a facility that, that's an f word in our business it's, it's not <laughs> it's and because it's family the the associates the residents they they work and, and together and it's so such a close relationship that um first when it comes to sales i think uh, the perspective that i could bring in partnership to sales is to help manage expectations because you don't want to get into a situation where you're going to say one thing 
Um, and then when, if there's a move in or, or what have you after a sale, uh, well, that's not what you, you know, that's not what you said. It's, it, it's so important to manage that expectation and be open, honest, and transparent, uh, which ties in with our brand and, and our culture. Uh, but I think that um, helps down the road too, um, from a referral standpoint, retention standpoint. Um, and you know what, I, I would even go as far as to say, you know what, if this isn't the right thing for you, we're going to tell you where it might be. Because you know what, down the road, they can come back to you. So I nice. just think managing expectations is just a, a critical, critical thing. And the second is more tactical. And um, we have a post sales visit survey. Um, so with a, a whole keyword trigger alert system. So if something comes up following a visit, it goes immediately out for resolution. So um, that's uh, you know, more tactical, but important, very, very important. I'll, I'll never react the same way when somebody says the F word again. So I, now I know that's, that was, that was worth the price of admission. Just that one. So, Hey, we, I think we got time for one more comment from the audience and I think it's a great one for our, our panel. So I'll go to you first, Jonathan, but this is from Laura um, Romero Bambio, Barambio, sorry. Um, what advice would you give to young professionals starting in CX? You know, this is a great question because most of us got into it before we knew we were a, a profession, but here now we have somebody that's actually entering into our profession. So, uh, Jonathan, I, I was, take I, first I, shot. That's a great question, Laura. I have two answers to that. The first is it's uh, I would align with a mentor, a senior mentor, a leader in, in your organization um, who can really uh, help bring you along, share perspective, open and honest, uh, give you open, honest feedback and challenge you. So I would say number one is a mentor. Um, the second thing, and this is something that I did when I got to senior living, is I, you know, I wasn't from the senior living world. And in my interview, they said, Jonathan, you have no experience in senior living and healthcare. So if you get the job, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I've always been um, told that you want to be in customer experience. You want to get as close to your customers as you possibly can. So that being said, if I get the job at this at Brookdale Senior Living, I want to I want to move in. I want to live there. And my second week on the job, I did. I actually spent the week um, living with our customers, living with our residents, living with our associates, not just touring and visiting. I lived with them. I worked out with them. I ate three meals a day with them. And I really wanted to live and breathe what this experience was like. Because for me to do my job, I had to really understand it. So what, my advice to you is whatever industry you're in, go work in that industry. If it's in a kitchen, whatever it is, work with the associates, understand the customers, because it'll give you a whole different appreciation. And by the time I left that community, I had 100 grandmas and grandpas who didn't want me to leave. <laughs> that is awesome. Hey, top that, Sandy. I don't know that I can. And Jonathan is one of my favorites. So I'm like, man, I just learned something new. Um, <laughs> So I so I'm going to start with his with his second one. I don't disagree with the the role of mentorship. Um, sometimes, in a lot of the a lot of companies, depending upon the size, sometimes the mentor may not be internal. You may have to find somebody who's external. CXPA has a ton of them, so that's like my is my one plug for them. Um, my the, I think the 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 second point that Jonathan was making about really digging in, um, honestly. That is really important is to kind of, if you can, if you are not in a B2C um, and to some extent, some B2B worlds, you can, you know, kind of really immerse yourself in. Um, I found that that was easier on the B2C side versus when you get to the B2B where you may be selling what I'll just call widgets. In that case, it's important to just try to find somebody who people throughout the organization can help educate you on what the experience is and what it should be, like what they would like it to be. Um, and then when it comes down to, uh, so it really comes down to really educating yourself. And the other aspect would be, even if you're not drawn to, you know, some of the harder skills of CX, still learn and read and try to like arm yourself with information that is going on. There is a wealth of knowledge out there um, that sometimes, you know, as we were even talking about for this, for these traits, these are not like brand new off the press as much as it is you guys have continued to collect the data and those things continue to change. So making sure that you're just continuing to find, especially those areas that you don't necessarily dig into um, on a day in and day out basis, trying to see if you can learn um, a little bit about those spaces as well, just to arm yourself with that knowledge as you continue to grow in your career. 
That's great advice. Thank you for sharing both of you. Um, you know, we're uh, kind of at that point um, and we, uh, I never do a podcast without getting some take home value. Uh, and the uh, questions keep rolling in. So we'll try to capture those and make sure we get uh, some of you some answers back in another way. But I want to go around uh, the horn here and I'll start with you, Lori, first, but um, sort of reflecting on this uh, top 10 traits, what's what's your, um, I guess, you know, what what's the one thing that you would like our audience to take from uh, this uh um, session today that that they could really uh, help improve their own approach to create developing their own professional um, abilities. Yeah, I think one thing, and we've touched on this throughout, is remembering that you are you do not have to do or be it all. Um, we talk quite a bit and with organizations about establishing governance and establishing a center of excellence, establishing a team. And it's really about not only knowing your strengths and your areas of opportunity, but then circling and, and surrounding yourself with others that, that have different strengths um, than you have. Um, one other piece, I'm gonna give two. The oh, other bonus. thing I would say here is, and it's something that has just really emerged, particularly in the last few years, that isn't a trait here, but I think underpins all of this is having a lot of patience. You know, things have changed in our world uh, in the CX space a lot in the last two years with this pandemic. And a lot of activity was happening. And then we had to quickly pivot and change and reevaluate. Yeah. So I think this idea of patience and reevaluation of kind of where we're headed is, is kind of an underpinning that I think everybody should just keep in mind um, that we're all in the same boat and we're all trying to drive towards the right uh, end goal. And patience is critical in doing so. Nice. Sandy, what's your uh, best tip for our listeners today? Yeah, my best tip it comes down to, and it's actually one of the traits we didn't talk that we didn't really talk that much about, but it comes down to focus. Um, because of uh, kind of building off what Lori is saying, because the fact that we are still in this, you know, period of trend, you know, transition, folks want to go back to the office, some people want to stay home, whatever it may be. Um, but the role of customer experience has become even more paramount. And so Focusing in on doing those um, things that are appropriate for your organization and recognizing what worked um, even maybe 12 months ago may not work today. And then we may be looking, um, maybe looking a little bit different another 12 months on down the road because things are still transitioning and evolving. So making sure that you're focusing on something that is really setting your organization up for strategic success. And then at the same time saying it's okay if we need to change a little bit or pivot um, in order to reflect what is going on out in the world right now. Thank you, Jonathan. Wow. I would say my first tip is to call Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a good one. And Thanks, then, I well, you, tip, you, you can't, know, yeah, that one doesn't count. <laughs> the thing about CX, and I've learned this my whole career, it's, it could be viewed as soft and fuzzy and fluffy and kind of out there. And I just think that we need to be bold and we need to challenge the status quo and really connect emotionally with this. And I, you know, to Lori's point before that there's the what and the why. And, and I think, bringing the emotional part to this and getting people to think, you know, they're consumers too and putting their consumer hats on helps them see it from that perspective too. Cause again, we get so caught up in data and numbers, but you know what, we, we all spend money and, and, and we tell stories based on it. So it's really bringing it down um, to, to the most basic powerful level, I think is so, so impactful. Uh, but like I said, be bold, challenge the status quo and do things differently. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, just take a minute to thank each of you for um, being a part of the program today and for uh, bringing your expertise to this topic. Um, Lori, especially for instigating, being one of the instigators of this uh, project that, that really is timeless. You know, it's got four years of shelf life at least. And, um, you know, I just so glad that we're able to, to do this. And then Sandy and Jonathan bringing your experience and, and, uh, you know, uh, being very vulnerable and open about your own careers and, and how that's shaped you, I think is just so valuable. And, uh, you know, uh, I love the question from the young person. That's uh, yeah, kind great. of a, it's, it's a, it's a great yes. part of having our um, Absolutely. Um, profession um, maturing to this point. You know, I, I, I teased a little bit, but our colleague Jen Batley said that we missed one. 
and and you guys were all over it there. But um, one of the keys that she said that we should have had in there was persistence, um, because I think you're right. You know, there's some things we can control and there's a lot that we can't. Uh, but the cause is noble and it is a long term play. It's an infinite game that we're playing here. And, uh, you know, so you, you got to adjust. You got to be willing to, you know, make adjustments. Sandy, you said what's working today may not work 12 months from now. Right. You know, Laura, you said you got to be patient. And, uh, you know, part of that that passion, I think it's the other side of passionate is you just have to believe in your heart that, you know, you're doing the right thing and and you just got to stick with it. So and then lastly, I think, you know, we're so fortunate to be in this profession at this time because our organizations just have such an appetite for this. Um, that, you know, we, we should re re remain grateful. And to your point, Jonathan, you know, we have a lot of value to deliver and, uh, you know, fortune favors the bold. Um, you know, we, we, we should be bold. We have a lot of value to uh, uh, give to our organizations and to the marketplace. And uh, that's really the purpose of, of our profession is to make sure that uh, we're delivering on, on that for our customers and employees. Thanks again, everybody. Um, you know, uh, we are going to do a, a series of these um, and um, over the next uh, year, I think we're going to do them about every other month. And um, so we'll want to make sure that uh, you're, you're all aware of that. And um, I think we might have a slide on that. Do we, do we, Gabe? Maybe what our, our next topic is? <laughs> I'm not sure if we have a, uh, have a slide for the next one. Uh, we'll, we'll get that out there soon, though, Steve. Um, you know, I just wanted to, to, to say from my perspective, uh, this is fantastic. And I want to share Julie's comment that just came in. Um, she said, thank you all. CX gets lonely and pushing that boulder up the hill. Great resources and inspiration and keeping up the good fight. Uh, I'll be reaching out for mentorship from CXPA2. That's great, Julie. Love to hear that. And Steve, you know, I got to thank you for doing such an amazing job hosting. I feel my grasp on this hosting gig just keep getting more and more tenuous. Every time you come on and do one of these shows, you do such a great job. So you know, well, I appreciate you help forcing me to up my game here. You got nothing to worry about, my friend. And uh, <laughs> we're grateful for the partnership. And uh, actually, uh, I did find in my notes there when I was struggling, uh, the, the next uh, session in this series is going to be Tuesday, March 29th. Perfect. So mark your calendars for that. Um, but I do not know exactly what the topic is, but we got a whole list of things that we're thinking about. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, well, everyone, you know, thank you all the guests. And uh, speaking of upping your game, uh, you know, we hope that you're going to keep uh, upping your game uh, along with us here on these live streams. And if you're enjoying these, you want more career resources to help you build your network, to help you take the next step in your career. Uh, we hope that you're going to join us at cxpa.org uh, as well. So uh, as Steve said, hope you have a great week, everyone. Thank you for all that you are doing to help lead customer-focused change uh, in your organizations. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>